Thank you, thank you very much. So I'm taking you to not to only to new horizons, but to beyond the horizon, to the North Pole. I'm, I've been there 25 years as a biologist. I'm studying animals over there. And so much is changing over there that I wanted to share that with you. So we go to Spitsbergen, named by Willem Barens. And if you see where it's, if you are at the North Cape of Norway, then still, if you look to the North Pole, it's halfway, 900 kilometers more north. And in winter, on the east side, it's just out of the ice. On the west side, there's a lot of ice. Uh, because the east side has the warm current coming up, and the uh, west side has the cold current coming down. I'm taking you to two places, one village on the le left side and an island on the east side. It's our pole, uh, our area a little bit, not just because the name, but Willem Barnes discovered it, and then there was a lot of whale hunting. Actually, some of the whales were exterminated by Dutch. There are Dutch graveyards in the frozen soil. And actually, my colleague digged some of these graveyards, and they have wonderful clothes which were preserved from the 17th century. So it's our North Pole. I go to a little town, the most northerly town of the world, and this is Nialesund. And there's an international community over there doing research, very special. And one of the houses is my house, a little hut, which is called the Netherlands Arctic Station. What is happening there is actually quickly changed. It's related to climate warming. The North Pole, there we have already a temperature increase of three degrees. And in an area where it's just around zero degrees, it's a big difference if it's freezing below zero or if it's above zero. So lots of changes. Just a picture which was taken by Greenpeace just near to my study area, a glacier. They had an old picture of this site. It looked like this in 1980. So if you look at the two pictures together, you can see the mountain tops are still the same, but the area has changed enormously. And what does it mean for the animals? So since 1990, I'm studying barnacle geese up there. And I go there every year the mo at the moment when they, uh, the young are hatching. And I have collected data wh which date which bird was hatching. And if you look at the graph, then um, it shows the trend from actually 1990 to present day. And um, up to 2006, there wasn't any change. It was warming over there but the birds didn't change. It's, of course, difficult for a migratory bird to know when you have to adapt. 2006 was an extreme year, as you will see later on, and then the birds switched. It's important to adapt to these changes, but actually I think both in animals and in humans, we need the extremes to realize that we have to adapt. So now the geese are laying their eggs one week earlier, and I have to travel to Spitsbergen one week earlier to study them. After hatching, the young walk on the tundra, and I have ringed many of these geese. You see a coloring, green coloring FPT on the leg. So I know this family, and actually I can see that they have, at this moment, they have four goslings. But it does change because of polar foxes, for instance. Arctic foxes, they, uh, you might know them. In winter, they look like this, beautiful white pelt. But in summer, they are brownish. So this is a juvenile Arctic fox. And they kill a lot of geese because they need them also during winter. This is the time series of the Arctic fox predation. This is actually 100% is that none of the goslings dies up to they, uh, fledging, the moment they can fly. So from being born, some years all the goslings survive. But there are also some years in which none of the goslings survive. And actually, it shows that if you just go there for two years, you wouldn't notice what the pattern is. We need the long time series. We... It's not only on land, also in the water. Many new changes. If you look at these year, new fishes caught on Spitsbergen, actually the mackerel is the most recent one, which was traditionally along the whole of the Norwegian coast. 30 years ago, there was no mackerel fishery. It was in Netherlands and Denmark, but not along the Norwegian coast. Now there is mackerel fishing along the Norwegian coast, but even the fishes are caught on Spitsbergen. This is just a, a little bit how it goes with climate warming. 
different bird species. And the lower species, the eider duck, didn't change over the year. Actually, the thick-billed myrrh, they have a steep decline because their environment is changing and they can't adapt. And if you look at the kittiwake, it's going better. But if you look a little bit better to the diet of the kittiwake, then they have used the new situation. They are feeding on a new species, capelin, which came there for the first time in 2006. And they have started feeding on it, and actually they are more or less a success story. So it's very important we will have losers and winners. One of the new trends which is at the moment happening is shown in this picture. First of all, this fjord, until 2006, every winter they could drive or walk to the other side of the fjord. They just walked from one side to the other, at least once in winter. Since 2007, it hasn't happened anymore. No ice on the water. But what happens right now is that in midwinter it starts to rain and actually a lot of rain. So what you see here on the tundra is actually 10 centimeters of ice because the rain drops on the frozen ground, on the snow, and it freezes immediately. In the last five years, we had three years with more than 10 centimeters ice in winter on the tundra. And then we come to the ecosystem, to the animals. These animals are wintering there, and they die off in large numbers. So that's, that's a big problem right now. If you're an Arctic fox in that area, then uh, you're lucky, because when a reindeer is dead, you have a lot of food. So the Arctic foxes do well with this die-off of reindeer. But as a result, my geese, in summer, there are many Arctic foxes. And that's why they have difficult years, where none of the young survive, because there are too many Arctic foxes. This is a picture of last summer. And of course, we all know the story of the polar bear and climate change. Ice, uh, sea ice is disappearing, and the polar bears have less territory to feed. Remember, this is not climate change. This is a sick polar bear. This was completely wrong to link this to climate change. That's, of course, also very important. We have to understand the story. What's happening in, my, in our area on Spitsbergen is actually that we see many more polar bears. Because, of course, what we see, the story is true. The ice is disappearing and the polar bears come to land. And they come to our village. Since 2005, we have several polar bears in the village. And I can tell you it's quite exciting because the polar bear is one of the two animals. Only tigers and polar bears will judge you but think that you are food. Well, all the other wild animals, they only attack you when they are feeling danger. But a polar bear will hunt you. So that's something you have to remember. The barnacle geese were, of course, on the islands breeding, and they are faced with polar bears eating their eggs. So some years, this is a picture of a colleague of mine, Jauke Prop, and for many years, all the nests were taken there by the polar bears. And he has a beautiful graph, because he started in 19... 79, and actually I was with him in 87 and 88, and I was just walking through the area. There were no polar bears there. And in 2000 it changed, and at this moment he has, every three days, he has another polar bear roaming through the area. So he's still camping there, but he's now behind a big fence, electrical fence. What's the complication in the polar bear story? The polar bears are very difficult to count. White on white, and they use a tremendous home range. We don't know how many polar bears there are. But actually, the number of polar bears has been increasing since 1972. Up to 1972, they were hunted. There were things like this on the, uh, on the coast. Boxes with a gun in it, and then a, a rope to the trigger, and a little bit of seal meat. And when the polar bear came, took the seal meat, then it shot through the head. It was, of course, very effective to kill polar bears. This is a picture of a small wildlife camera, which you can buy in a German uh, supermarket, uh, actually a Dutch supermarket, but from a German company. And they take pictures when something moves. So this is just a picture. You can see on the right top horizon, you can see the village where we are living. Actually, what's happening now, until the protection of the polar bears, of course, every polar bear which came close to people was shot. Now they are protected, and this young one has been growing up close to the village. So that might be the next problem bear 
trying to find food inside the village. In 1968, we had Dutch people do wintering on the east side of Spitsbergen doing polar bear research. They caught 12 polar bears, they released them. Four of them were killed in the next summer, shot on the west coast, showing how the, how the hunting pressure was enormous. But these were all data, and in, even on that place in 77, they did a lot of research over there, looking at the vegetation, looking at the reindeer. I wanted to go back there, and so I, I had the idea of an expedi expedition. And actually, I did many things to get into the news and get people, get funding. This is my polar bear suit. Trying to get money, it didn't work. I almost gave up. But then I got some money from the Dutch Science Foundation and actually with some sponsors we were able to go last summer to the east side of Spitsbergen and do research over there. And it's a complete wilderness, nobody is living there. There has even been hardly any research going on because it's so much uh, desolate. But what we knew from the satellites was that it was two months longer already every year out of the ice big environmental changes, and we wanted to see what other things were changing over there. So we had a big boat with 55 scientists from the Netherlands, and even the national news was on the boat. And we went to the east and did a lot of research over there with all these people. And of course, you're in a tremendous environment over there. Here you can see on the top, close to the glaciers, with a small boat where the glaciers rumble and the ice falls down, walruses on the beach which is, was actually also new for the winters, which were with us, because when the winters were there, there were no walruses, also an effect of hunt in the 1800s. And the whales are increasing too. We saw many, many whales. A lot of research going on. I'll just tell you about one project in which I was involved myself, which was with a, the big boat, and then we went in the smaller boats, and then we went on the island, and this was a valley which was mapped very carefully in 77. And I showed you earlier, that's where I showed these time series, just to tell you a little bit about how important these time series is for documenting change. And we had this old data, and so by going back there we could collect new data, what has changed there. So we had vegetation maps of this valley which I just showed to you. And uh, there were exact spots on the map, where they had looked at the vegetation very carefully. And we put these maps on a new, sa new satellite image. Actually, a satellite, photo satellites are so good. Uh, one pixel is one quarter of a square meter. So it's enormous. If you zoom in on this, you can see a, a table standing over there on the picture. So we could find back the places where they did their measurements earlier, and we went back in the field. This is just doing our work, but actually below the arrow there was, for three days, there was a polar bear lying on the dead reindeer. So it was quite of exciting too to work in that environment. And it's the island with the highest density of polar bears, so we were very concerned with safety. And actually I didn't look much to the vegetation, I had selected people who could do that, but I had to guard them for the polar bear all the time. This was a spot where in 77 they had a vegetation cover of 70%. So now it's four, something like that. We actually selected the spot with the most cover uh, in the area which, which was mapped. But the whole environment was just void of vegetation. Of course, other places there was more. We carefully mapped it all, and after this, the third day, we, f we started to think what has happened. And we looked at the landscape, and actually these kind of things have happened. It's a landslide going down, so the high points were just sliding down, removing all the vegetation and just coming to bare ground again. And that had happened all over the valley. We looked at other places, and we saw other traces of this vegetation change. Why? Normally, the, f the soil is frozen. In summer, only the top layer thaws. And the deepest they measured in, 50, in 77, 1977 was 50 centimeters. Now we measured at the same spots, and we were 75 centimeters deep. So the, f the, the ice is disappearing from the soil, and that creates instability. And so there's a movement, and actually the whole valley is more or less slowly moving like a glacier with the speed of a glacier moving down 
to the, uh, to the sea. And so tremendous vegetation change is not because simple the temperature, but simply be in an interaction with the permafrost, the whole mo uh, valley started to move. We were with 55 scientists. If you look at the website, you find all kinds of stories of different things which happened. Uh, the national news made a wonderful series about what we're all doing. And so thank you very much for your attention.